about just now. Um, welcome to the fifth annual Politicians and Professionals series, um, where this year we are hearing from the leaders of each of Scotland's main political parties on Scotland after Brexit. Um, I'm Jane Francis Kelly, I'm the uh, director of the David Hume Institute. Um, I'd like to thank all of our sponsoring organisations, and, uh, and now I'm trying to do the trick of naming them in order of their logo. Um, the Institute and Faculty of Advocates, I got that one wrong immediately, didn't I? Yes, I'm going to go back to my notes. The Faculty of Advocates, the Institute and Faculty of Adv Actuaries, the Royal Society of Edinburgh, the Law Society and the Young Academy of Scotland. And I'd particularly like to thank Alan Watson, leader of the Scottish Council of the Institute and Faculty of Ad Ad Actuaries for chairing the proceedings this evening. Because the actuaries have an institute as well as a faculty. We had and then we merged them. Right. <laughs> really decision to come up with a name like that. <laughs> um, and uh, we'd also like to thank the many people involved in making the series work from those organisations, in particular Tim Mouncer, Andrew Tregoning, Tess Joyce, Morvan Chisholm, Julie Steele, Graham Herbert and others. We couldn't do this without them. So the order of business will be uh, as follows. Uh, Richard Leonard, MSP, will speak for something around 35 to 40 minutes. Uh, the chair will then moderate an audience Q&A, which will start with a question from Professor Nasser Mir, uh, co-chair of the Young Academy of Scotland. Is that right? Yes. yes. Um, following the Q&A, Sir John Elvidge, our chair of trustees, will propose a vote of thanks. Then Dr F Fiona McNeil will take a couple of minutes to speak about the Young Academy's work. Is Fiona here? She will be. Right. <laughs> if Fiona doesn't make it, Professor Nasser Mir will double up. And then, having made you listen to him twice, uh, he has luckily previously provided uh, for everyone to have a glass of wine afterwards in the lobby, which we'll aim to have in your hand by 7.30 at the latest. Turning to our speaker, we're very fortunate to have the new minted leader of the Scottish Labour Party with us. A member of the Scottish Parliament since May 2016, Richard Leonard was elected Labour leader in November 2017. Prior to, come, prior to coming into Parliament, he worked for the GMB trade union and as an STUC economist, um, and so has written extensively on the Scottish economy. And because I'm a Scot with this accent who lived for many years outside of Scotland, I've given myself a pass on complimenting other people on their accents and how enjoyable they are to listen to because it happened to me three times a day for 26 years. Um, his accent is fantastic. Um, it is, it's a pleasure to hear it, something different. Everybody in Scotland sounds Scottish, it's just like, it's really weird. All that remains is for me to ask you to please turn off your mobile phones. If somebody could turn off the recording while I do this, I would agree as well. Uh, but now turn it on. Uh, and join me in welcoming the leader of the Scottish Labour Party, Richard Leonard, MSP. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> well, thank you very much indeed. I, uh, um, I would like to begin by uh, thanking the uh, David Hume Institute uh, for the invitation to speak tonight. Uh, and for the important role uh, it performs in what I think is a very necessary uh, forum for serious and informed uh, policy debate in Scotland. Too often in our fast-paced world of 24-hour uh, news cycles and um, um, uh, media coverage, which is non-stop, real debate and robust intellectual scrutiny of political ideas and policies uh, can be overlooked. Uh, in favour of a quick uh, headline-grabbing uh, approach and often an emotional rush in response. And I suppose never is that clearer uh, than during the coverage of great political upheavals, be they constitutional referenda or the election of a president with itchy Twitter fingers. Of course, Brexit is where most of our current political attention is focused, our newspapers, televisions, uh, radios, our smartphones give us every alarmist twist and turn of the negotiations, 
inviting us to feel horrified or assured in our opinions in equal measure. As a result, in my view, serious informed scrutiny is all too rarely on offer. Institutes like this uh, are vital, therefore, for giving us that space. So again, thank you to the David Hume Institute uh, for the work uh, that you do. David Hume would no doubt have found the EU referendum and its outcome endlessly fascinating, given the interest uh, that he had in human nature and the differences which lie between perception and experience, uh, and importantly, the impact that those differences have on our judgments and whether we always act in our own self-interest. And I have a feeling that there could be a fine treatise on that by a Hume scholar sometime soon. The title of the series of speeches at the start of this year is Scotland After Brexit. And it's hard to imagine sometimes that such a time will come, given how tortured uh, the process has so far been. Uh, and I should confirm at the very start that I'm happy to accept this working title in the spirit of heuristic endeavour and inquiry. And as it happens, I do believe that the UK will leave the European Union. And I do believe that Scotland will remain part of the UK. But I accept that there are people engaged in the debate who take an opposite view on both of these points. Some of my own formative political experience uh, came as a researcher to the late Alex Falconer, who was a Labour member of the European Parliament uh, for Mid-Scotland and Fife from 1984 to 1999. And I worked with him uh, during those years when the foundations for the European single market were being laid, when the single European Act, uh, as I recall, was being guillotined uh, through Parliament, uh, when economic and monetary union uh, was being envisaged. And our priorities were then, all those years ago, as they are now today, around how best to promote the interests of working people and how best to build an economy that works in the interests of the many and not just uh, the few. So I bring a, a long view uh, to this new challenge. Let me be clear as well that I voted to remain and I campaigned for a remain vote. This was in part because of the level of economic integration that was evident after 45 years of membership of this economic club. It was my belief then and it still is my belief now that leaving would and will bring with it an economic shock. But I also campaigned for a Remain vote because of the xenophobia which underpinned the predominant elements in the Leave campaign. So I voted and campaigned for a Remain vote, but I understand that no matter how you cast your vote, you undoubtedly did so in the belief that it was for a better future. No one, no one voted to be poorer, no one voted to narrow the options of their children or their grandchildren. We always vote in the belief that what comes after has to be better than what went before. And unfortunately, uh, my side lost something my detractors will no doubt suggest, which is something I've had to get used to in recent years. So here we are now in the process of leaving the European Union and as a result facing unique, unique, unprecedented challenges in uncharted waters. And it's the way that we approach these challenges that will decide whether they become opportunities or simply threats. To that end, in my view, there needs to be a plan and in my estimation, there simply isn't one. While the 27 other European Union member states act in consort, the UK government, in my view, is in disarray, with the divisions in the Cabinet plain for all to see, whether it's the continual opposing statements of Philip Hammond and Boris Johnson, or whether there are or there are not any Brexit impact statements 
Three little words the Secretary of State for exiting the EU, David Davis, I suspect has nightmares about. The Scottish Government does appear to be more focused, but not necessarily more focused on what is right for Scotland. As always, their approach is first and foremost about what is right for the SNP. So on the one hand, we have a Conservative Government intent on turning its back on the European Union single market and turning its back on Europe, and on the other is an SNP Government intent on turning its back on the UK single market, on England, Wales and Northern Ireland, this even though four times as many jobs in Scotland depend on exports to that single market as depend on exports to the EU. The SNP position, uncritically in favour of an ever-deepening of the European Union single market, whilst at the same time advocating a dramatic breach with the rest of the UK and the Economic and Monetary Union, which underpins it, is in my view illogical and incoherent. Indeed, the whole SNP approach to Brexit is intellectually and economically dishonest, and I'll get to that later. But Scottish Labour is clear, Labour in Westminster is clear, the government needs to put our economy and jobs at the heart of the Brexit negotiations so we can rise to the challenges it will undoubtedly present. Migration. Migration is one such important challenge. Yet according to the Scottish Government's own worst case scenario analysis published two weeks ago, which focused in their own words, and I quote them, to highlight the, the likely impact of a hard Brexit, a fall in immigration by 2030 will account for a 2.5% decrease in Scotland's income. But in that very same analysis, a forecasted, a forecasted decline in productivity will account for a 5.8% reduction in Scotland's GDP. It was the Nobel Prize winning economist Paul Krugman, a fan I think of David Hume, who said productivity isn't everything, but in the long run, it is almost everything. A country's ability to improve its standard of living over time depends almost entirely on its ability to raise its output per worker. So the challenges of Brexit reinforce a belief that I've held for many years, my whole time, in the Scottish Labour and Trade Union movement, that a more proactive approach to the economy is needed. Consequently, Scotland has got to change. It's got to change in terms of how economic power is exercised and by whom. It needs a different and a more active approach from government and the public sector. Critically, it needs new forms of ownership and higher levels of investment and an economy where the proceeds are shared more equitably. Brexit, with all its challenges, only reinforces this need for a step change in how we do things. If we do not do this in the context of Brexit, we will simply drift further from the high-skill, high-wage economy that I believe Scotland needs. The Scottish Government regularly claims that the Scottish economy is both resilient and diverse. I wish it was so. In fact, just 15 businesses account for 30% of the value of all of Scotland's international exports. Just 10 companies account for 45% of all business research and development. Before Brexit, economic diversification was necessary through an active Scottish industrial policy with less market and more planning in the economy. Now with Brexit on the horizon, this is more urgent than ever. And so we in the Scottish Labour Party will be pushing for the establishment of a Scottish industrial policy. And quite separately, we will be pushing the UK government for an active regional policy too both of which should be aimed at the development of greater indigenous economic ownership growth, including a new and burgeoning cooperative and employee ownership sector. And that's where 
My focus will be this evening how we make Scotland a more productive nation in the face of Brexit. But before I discuss what needs to happen to future-proof Scotland's economy, uh, let's take a look at the Brexit process so far, if you can bear it. When the Scottish Parliament was created, many people, myself included, fought long and hard to ensure that it would be more than merely a democratic replacement for power exercised by ministers in the Scottish office, important though that was. It was established to be a parliament with real power and real authority. And one of my first tasks when I went to work as an assistant secretary at the Scottish TUC in 1991 was to contribute to a consultation document which the STUC's general counsel had drawn us as, as the secretariat led by Campbell Christie to draw up called Power for Change. It was a programme for action for the devolved Scottish Parliament which we were campaigning for. We didn't simply demand the establishment of a Scottish Parliament for the sake of it, it was power we wanted for a purpose. Ultimately then, the 1998 Scotland Act was unambiguous in its construction that everything that was not expressly reserved to Westminster was to be devolved to the Scottish Parliament. Unfortunately, the Conservatives appear to have forgotten that defining and vital founding principle. In recent months, through the Brexit process, in my view, they have trampled all over the devolution settlement. The European Union Withdrawal Bill is not fit for purpose in terms of devolution. And the authoritarian approach means an arrogant refusal to listen even to its own Scottish bank benches. Scottish Secretary David Mundell is supposed to be Scotland's man in the cabinet but he certainly does not appear to be standing up for Scotland's interests in his failure to have Clause 11 of the bill, which specifically impacts on devolution amended. And what role has Ruth Davidson? That is a problem too. Ruth Davidson has let this disregard of devolution occur and this snub to the settled will of the Scottish people on her watch. As a result, in Holyrood, we voted against granting a legislative consent motion as the EU withdrawal bill currently stands. Playing fast and loose with the devolution settlement is unacceptable. And the Labour Party, the party which delivered devolution with the support of Civic Scotland, will not stand for it. Of course, this lack of trust in devolution from the Tories has been a straw for the SNP government to clutch at in its perpetual drive towards independence. Yet the SNP seems to have no real idea what Scotland after Brexit should look like. It has moved its position a number of times from demanding full membership of the European Union as an independent country to retaining single market membership preferring EFTA to the EU, and now back to full membership of the Single Market and Customs Union. Perhaps we should not be entirely surprised, as Eric Hobsbawm once put it, nationalism has been a great puzzle to non-nationalists, both politicians and theorists, ever since its invention, not only because it is both powerful and devoid of any discernible rational theory, but also because its shape and function are constantly changing. And disappointingly, we saw again that the Constitution trumps all uh, with the SNP when its MPs refused to vote for Labour amendments to the EU withdrawal bill, <clears throat> which would have established new procedures for the creation of UK-wide frameworks for retained EU law. Without doubt, the SNP is using Brexit to push its usual agenda and agitate for another referendum. Not another referendum to remain in the EU, but to leave the UK. Labour has at all times based its strategy on protecting the economy, jobs, and the interests of working people. 
and the four principles behind Labour's position are clear and unambiguous. Firstly, we respect the result of the EU referendum. Secondly, we accept the UK will leave the EU. Thirdly, by doing so, we will leave the existing uh, single market and the existing customs union. Therefore, we believe that we will need to negotiate a new deal because on leaving the EU, our membership of all existing treaties will end. Laid out like that, it seems, to me anyway, fairly simple. But of course, in truth, it's vastly complex, which is why Labour is playing critically an important role in holding the Conservative government to account during their haphazard handling of the Brexit negotiations. So we have been effective scrutineers. We have ensured that there will be a transitional period to protect and stabilise our economy after negotiations are completed and agreement is reached. We have focused on outcomes that retain the benefits of the single market and we have proposed the amendments to protect workers' rights, the rights of EU citizens living here in the UK, the economy, the devolution settlements, the environment and more. And that is why I can tell you tonight that I am fully confident that Labour simply will not vote for a Brexit deal that is bad for workers and bad for the economy. So when the time comes, we will judge the deal on the six tests set by Keir Starmer. Does it ensure a strong and collaborative future relationship with the EU? Does it deliver the exact same benefits as we currently have as members of the single market and the customs union? Does it ensure the fair management of migration in the interests of the economy and communities? Does it defend the rights and protections and, present and prevent a race to the bottom? Does it protect national security and our capacity to tackle cross-border crime? And does it deliver for all regions and nations of the UK? So Labour is clear that we want a deal that is a good deal for the people of this country, not no deal and not a bad deal. That must mean a deal that retains the benefits of the single market and the customs union, but which negotiates in other areas that we believe have not been as be beneficial for the UK economy. So that's been Labour's focus. It will continue to be our focus and we will dedicate all our attention on that until agreement is reached. So what happens after the EU uh, 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 secession takes place? Well, the challenges will be multiple, but thankfully there are solutions. In recent times, we have seen both the UK and Scottish governments hide behind the rules of the EU in order to stop the passage of progressive legislation. There is no doubt that the European Union has been used to force through a market-based approach to some areas of public policy where markets should have no place. In turn, this has driven down growth in our economy, driven up job insecurity and driven down wages for working people. Here in Scotland, the competition framework for the non-domestic sector in the water industry, for, a, for example, has been affected in this way as has the tendering of the contract for the Hebridean and Argyle routes, the Calmac routes, and for the Northern Isles ferry link. It has had a part to play too in the award of the ScotRail contract to Abellio and was the basis for the Scottish Government's refusal to make the living wage a condition for private contractors carrying out public works and public supply contracts through the passage of the Procurement Act in 2014. So Labour would have advocated a renewed EU reform agenda in these areas if we were remaining in the European Union. I also believe that there are times 
when uh, what many would, would recognise as the Brussels defence has been used as an excuse, and that a robust stance, particularly on the provision of lifeline public services, could and should have been taken. At a UK level too, a different approach was possible. To take one example, reliance on the so-called Swedish derogation to remove equal rights from agency workers bestowed by the European Union Directive has been the subject of a legal challenge led by the TUC. The provision of the so-called UK opt-out from the Working Time Directive has allowed for excessive working hours to prevail in breach of a measure which, after all, was designed to provide health and safety protection and rights for workers. As a result, we currently estimate that around a quarter of a million workers in Scotland routinely, routinely work in excess of 48 hours a week. This is no way to run an economy. In my view, we need to retain the provisions of that working time directive, like the right to paid holidays, the right to time off between shifts, and the minimum rights to breaks, including the additional protection afforded to young people in the workplace. But over time, I think we need to end the opt-out by managing a planned reduction of excessive working hours in such a way that earnings do not drop and new, new secure employment is created. This should be seen in the context of automation and the need to drive up productivity. We also want to see a transfer of powers from the European Union and its institutions to the Scottish Parliament, not to Westminster <clears throat> and Whitehall. So key areas like environmental regulation, agriculture, fisheries, public procurement and state aid should be put in the hands of the Scottish Parliament. By protecting vital rights and opting for a more active approach to planning our economy, the challenges of Brexit can be met head on. For if the current state of play shows us anything, it is that an active approach is vital to ensure that we shape and nurture a resilient economy. As I said earlier, the SMP's, SMP's approach to Brexit is intellectually and economically dishonest. The Scottish Government's recently produced paper on Brexit notes that the EU single market will still be seven times the size of the UK market after we leave. But that is purely in terms of population. The analysis fails to recognise that the UK market is currently worth four times as much to the Scottish economy. Further evidence that an active approach is needed is illuminated in the Scottish Government's worst case scenario in that foreign investment to Scotland would drop by almost a quarter. As Ernst & Young's attractiveness survey of Scotland notes, Brexit will be a major change to the overall trade position and as such requires a clearly defined strategy setting out Scotland and the UK's trade strategy and how this will be realised. This underlines again the need for an active industrial policy to reduce uncertainty for employees and investors alike. It underlines the fact that the private sector too is dependent on state decisions. It underlines the need for a real plan which stops Scotland just being a consumer nation but once again turns us into a nation which produces those things that people need. Economist uh, Professor Mariana Mazzucato recognises that a strong industrial strategy has many benefits and it is the best way the state can help drive economic growth. I agree. Which is why Scottish Labour last year launched an industrial strategy which lays out the steps which need to be taken to shape a resilient economy and a healthy society. It is a strategy which advances democracy and equality in the economy so that the proper role of trade unions as representatives of workers is recognised and so that women 
who are all too often shut out from the corridors of economic power, are finally let in. We need to consider how we can use the existing and soon to be repatriated powers that we will have to expand the horizons of working people in this country and thereby bring hope back to those communities that we are sent to the Scottish Parliament to serve. There are profound inequalities in the real rate of unemployment, the unequal burden of unemployment between the best and worst parts of Scotland, which are far, far greater than the official figures would lead us to believe. Indeed, Professor Steve Fothergill uh, recently estimated that the real rate of unemployment is 8.6% of the workforce, which is double the official narrow measure. So our economy is fundamentally unbalanced. What is needed is a credible, radical and compelling strategy for reindustrialisation and a rebalancing of the post-Brexit Scottish economy. Our new relationship with the European Union will provide a new path. Having the right to determine our own procurement policy, to deliver apprenticeships and skills, to end bogus self-employment, to end zero-hours contracts and to pay decent wages must all be policy objectives. There are just some examples of areas in which governments have hidden behind EU procurement or state aid rules to avoid making progressive decisions. This active approach must support, too, a just transition to a greener Scottish economy in which technology supports us all to live more fulfilling lives. One of Scotland's greatest missed opportunities has been in renewable energy. We should, for example, have had wind turbines that were financed, built, owned and operated in this country, serving the interests of our economy and workforce. Communities and public bodies could have developed all of that in a truly sustainable way. But instead, the kit, the kit has invariably been built abroad and many of our wind farms are owned by foreign-owned multinationals, venture capital firms or wealthy individuals, with the result that the profits float off with every turn of the turbine blade to boardrooms in places such as Bilbao, Munich and Copenhagen. If ever there was an absence of planning and industrial policy, this is it. With the Scottish Government's worst case scenario finding that the fall in income overwhelmingly comes from productivity, perhaps Brexit should inject some added urgency. Added urgency to tackling the long-standing problems which focus our attention towards Scotland's productivity gap. Because increasing the level of productivity is key to achieving sustainable economic development, is key to raising incomes, and is key to creating better quality jobs. Scotland is one of the better performing parts of the UK by measure of productivity, but it is still below the UK average. To catch up would therefore require a significant and transformational increase in Scotland's rate of productivity, but the prize of success is substantial. Increasing Scotland's productivity to the level of the top quartile of OECD countries would mean a growth of GDP of almost £45 billion, an increase of 30%. And annual average wages uh, could be over £6,500 uh, uh, £6, higher, an increase of 25%, if those productivity gains uh, were delivered. Scottish manufacturing can provide the engine for much of this transformational change in productivity. It is manufacturing, after all, which continues to disproportionately drive innovation, investment and international exports. The Scottish Government should take a more proactive approach to improving Scotland's productivity challenge by fully utilising the £11 billion lever uh, that is represented by public procurement. The discourse in the Scottish Parliament over the last few years has regularly focused on what powers the current government does not have 
rather than the ones that it does. One of these areas is public procurement, which has been devolved since the Parliament's inception. Public procurement is not some technical matter, but one that has a major impact on people's livelihoods, their workplaces, their conditions of employment, and their public services. The collapse of Carillion illustrates this reach well. Indeed, such is the weight of that £11 billion purchasing power that it equates to almost 90% of the value of what the Scottish Government raises in income tax, or a third of the overall budget. Yet despite the leverage potential to drive up labour standards and improve corporate behaviours, it is rarely used. When the current First Minister was in charge of government procurement, she blocked the living wage condition. And she refused to intervene and block the award of public contracts to companies caught up in the construction industry blacklisting scandal, even after they had been publicly exposed. Tax avoiders are also found to be in the list of beneficiaries. And then there's the Scottish Futures Trust, an infrastructure delivery company owned by the Scottish Government, yet you may be surprised to learn that the 200 projects it is delivering are not covered by the Scottish Government's procurement guidance. In the Scottish Labour leadership campaign, I sought and won a mandate for what I called a values-led public procurement policy. The Scottish Government is simply not making the most of its purchasing power. We can use this to improve workers' pay and conditions. In short, public sector contractors, their corporate responsibility and their practice can become much more than a tick box exercise. So I've made clear that under a future Scottish Labour government, we will award public contracts only to organisations that meet standards. Standards like no blacklisting, no zero hours contracts, fair tax mark holders, with commitments to apprenticeships, pay ratios, tackling occupational segregation, paying at least the living wage, and recognising trade unions. And this goes to a wider point that I want to make in closing. The people who create our country's wealth should have a fairer share of the wealth which they create. Our society is deeply divided. Poverty and inequality is rife and is growing. The richest 1% in Scotland today earn more, own more personal wealth than the whole of the poorest 50% put together. As a result, too much power rests in too few hands. The role of political leadership is, I believe, to focus on the future and to offer the people of the country a vision of that future, one they can believe in and one they can participate in. A future where they know that they will be able to get a decent job with decent pay, have a decent home to live in, and their children get a good education and go on to a good life too. I focus tonight on productivity, on workers' rights, but there are, of course, other challenges facing us as a result of Brexit. How do we ensure our citizens have access to environmental justice? How do we maintain environmental standards and protect our natural resources and habitats? What systems do we need to maintain product safety standards? How do we maintain consumer rights when purchasing goods and services? What type of trade deal would help Scottish businesses prosper most? How can we cooperatively work with developing countries? How do we support our farming and fishing communities to build a sustainable future? And so how do we support food production and develop food exports? And finally, how do we ensure our Parliament is ready to answer these questions? There will come a point as the Brexit negotiations run on when we will cease to be defensive and start to become more affirmative. Who knows? Our new European style may be more in the tradition of Zurich and Belgrade 
of Reykjavik and Oslo, or it may simply be in a tradition of our own making. What is without doubt is that the challenge ahead, the challenge to ensure that the lives of working people are improved and that they gain more, not less, control over their time and their incomes, the challenge of securing real full employment, of focusing on the industries and jobs of the future, the challenge of innovation and harnessing the advance of automation and the benefit that this can bring to the people of Scotland, the challenge to make Scotland a society of opportunity for all because the right economic decisions are being made at the heart of government, decisions which put jobs and prosperity, and prosperity first, the challenge we hope, in the Labour Party anyway, of a general election sooner rather than later, which will facilitate a Labour government being able to put into action our plans for a £20 billion investment in Scotland to further stimulate our, our economy. And the challenge as well to build new and cooperative relationships with our European neighbours. That is a challenge and these are the challenges which the Scottish Labour Party is ready to meet. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Um, now we have some time for questions and hopefully a good few answers. Uh, the first question will be from the uh, Young Academy of Scotland. Uh, hopefully that will give you time to contemplate and pluck up the courage to ask a few questions. Uh, we'll then take it in pairs, I think, for the questions. There are some roving microphones. Um, please wait for one of these to come to you before uh, asking your question. Please also state your name and organisation, if you have an organisation. I don't want to tick you off if you don't have an organisation like somebody did at a previous one. Um, brevity is much preferred in questioning, and I think I'd encourage you to actually ask questions rather, rather than offer statements. Um, and I hope you're going to offer some robust scrutiny that uh, Richard talked about earlier. So with that, can I ask... Um, Professor Nazar Mir to, to demonstrate on behalf of the Young Academy of Scotland how to ask a question. Thank you very much, Alan, and thank you very much, Richard. Uh, given the prevailing analysis um, from a number of organisations, including this one, that ending free movement will profoundly damage mm. Scotland's economy, where existing skills shortages in a number of areas are, are acute, um, I'm wondering whether UK Labour perhaps need a more bespoke Brexit migration position for Scotland and perhaps even get behind devolving migration entirely? You want to take them one at a time, Alan, yeah? Uh, well, well, the yeah, first okay. one is, is first, then we'll do it in pairs. Okay, okay, okay. Well, I mean, the, um, yeah, the, the, certainly the, uh, one of the concerns which I've had as, in the context of the debate that we've had, particularly in Scotland, around certain industries like um, agriculture and some of the food processing industries is that I'm concerned um, that what people are defending is not the freedom of movement of labor, but the freedom of movement of cheap labor. And so my starting point is to say that we need to uh, have a, a policy on uh, labor standards uh, that ensures that people are not the subject of any kind of double exploitation, which I fear in some parts of the economy is going on. So that's my first uh, observation about it. The second one is that um, uh, I think um, the IPPR produced a report fairly recently, and uh, I accept the Royal Society may have this position too, uh, calling for uh, de devolution of immigration policy. And certainly, um, I'm not sure whether John Elvich was at the um, um, Scottish executive at the time, but uh, the, the Labour uh, Liberal uh, coalition, when it was in government, introduced the Fresh Talent in Initiative, which understood the need for a nuanced approach to migration in different parts of the UK. So um, I am somebody who is very open to persuasion on uh, there being uh, a nuanced policy. The, it seems to me that there could be a strong case for um, a, 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 a policy which suits the London economy and London society, because I don't think it should simply be an economically driven approach to migration. Um, but I also think that there may therefore also be um, uh, a case for 
um, a separate or a, 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 a nuanced approach to migration in Wales, for example, or parts of Wales. So, so I th I'm, I'm quite open-minded about the question of uh, whether there should be a, 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 a variation on migration policy in Scotland. And I think, uh, you know, I think um, it's, it's something which we need to, uh, which we need to discuss. But, but I also think that we need to consider how we have reached a position, and I realise that there are some areas of the economy um, where this is uh, not the case uh, at the higher end and in some of the professionally um, uh, driven parts of the economy this may not be the case, and the university sector being a very good example of it. But there are um, uh, parts of the economy at the low pay end where I fear it's been used as a tool to uh, uh, bring in labour uh, at a reduced rate, and I've got as a trade union organiser in the Scottish economy over the years, I have some experience of this myself. Right, some questions. One at the, one at the front left there, and one at the very left at the back. Um, Ryan McQuig from Oxfam Scotland. Sort of building on from the immigration question, but related to refugees. Um, obviously, the current UK rules stop um, refugees, some refugees bringing in some family members and there's a bill going through the House of Commons on the 16th of March to, um, called the Refugee Family Reunion Bill that will bring families back together. I was just wondering if you are supportive of that bill and if you encourage your um, Westminster colleagues to vote for that bill when it comes in the House of Commons on the 16th of March, which is um, proposed by a, Scot by a Scottish MP. Hi, thank you. Um, you also have a name, Chair of Young European Movement UK. Um, Andrew Adonis made an interesting tweet a couple of days ago. Um, he was suggesting that in the name of party democracy within the Labour Party, there could be a referendum within Labour on Labour's position on Brexit, and then the party membership will be able to decide what, what Labour's approach should be. What are your thoughts on this initiative? Okay, well, um, I'm a great supporter of Labour Party democracy, and um, and we have a you know we, we don't have a command and control mechanism, certainly not these days anyway, and so um, there there are routes through which affiliated organisations, Labour Party members, can promote that debate inside the Labour Party. So I don't think there is any uh, there is any closure on that. I think it's it's perfectly feasible uh, for there to be a, a consideration of uh, Lord Adonis's proposal within the framework of decision-making inside the, inside the Labour Party. Where, where personally I've been a little bit wary is um, uh, the, the, the way in which uh, some parts of the political establishment have dealt with the outcome of the referendum. You see, I, I take um, what some may consider to be a rather simplistic view, but my view has been that we had a referendum in Scotland in 2014 in which the people voted to remain part of the UK. The franchise for the 2016 referendum was the UK, and therefore, uh, if the vote at the UK level was to leave, I think that we need to respect the outcome of that vote. Um, so I am, uh, I am not somebody who's persuaded of the case for a second referendum, for example. Uh, I think that uh, we need to concentrate at this stage on getting the best deal that we can, and at the moment that's the case of putting pressure on uh, heaven help us, David Davis, Theresa May, and Boris Johnson and Co. to do that, but I think I think that there is um, that, that there is um, uh, pressure which has been brought to bear, whether it's to achieve the transitional arrangements and so on, by Labour in the Westminster Parliament, and I think that we should uh, we should redouble our efforts to uh, to keep that pressure up and uh, keep the pressure up, for example, on the whole uh, clause 11 situation and whether or not uh, the devolved assemblies and parliaments are involved. So, uh, so I'm in favour of Labour Party internal democracy and, and I'd, nothing in my view would be ruled out if somebody wanted to raise that to, um, uh, to, to, uh, to change or to revise uh, the Labour Party's policy, but they would need to attract a majority view of those people taking part in that vote to do it. On the question of uh, refugees, I'm very sympathetic to um, uh, uh, providing uh, safe refuge for people who are fleeing disaster, fleeing war, fleeing persecution, uh, and I think, uh, in my view, it just seems uh, to be to be a simple uh, humanitarian uh, sense uh, that if uh, 
somebody has uh, been granted refugee status here, then their family should be allowed to come over here and to join them. So I'm, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm probably on the more libertarian wing of the Labour Party. I don't know whether that's the, the position that's going to be adopted by the Parliamentary Labour Party, but that would certainly, uh, certainly would, be, uh, would be my view. And I think, it, to be frank, um, down the years, uh, people like Jeremy Corbyn have been very active on these kind of uh, questions around um, asylum seekers, around uh, refugees, uh, and around uh, uh, support for people who are in, uh, especially those in, in war-torn parts of the world. So uh, I would have thought that uh, it would be the right thing to do to support that, um, to support that piece of legislation. And I don't have a page of these days going off to tell me what the answer is, so you'll have to rely on my good judgment on that, Ryan. Yeah, do people still have pages in the Labour Party? Uh, <laughs> I think they might be making a comeback. Do you? Two more questions. One at the front here and another one there. some way in which Scotland would remain in the European Union, given that, as you believe, it would be financially um, possibly disastrous for the UK as a whole, and thus, in a rather weaker economy, disastrous for Scotland. Would you not be under pressure to find some way out of that dilemma? <coughs> Alice Koenig um, from the University of St Andrews and also a member of the Young Academy of Scotland. Um, the Brexit debate has obviously been incredibly divisive. Um, you um, respect the result of the referendum, um, which is democratic up to a point. Obviously, a single referendum is only part of a democratic process. Um, but what it means is that half of the country is left um, following the um, uh, uh, choice of the other half. Now, I've been interested that a lot of your language when you're talking about the other parties has been very combative scrutiny um, uh, um, and uh, you know, other metaphors you've used. Um, and I was wondering what you, what you think about um, the way forward. Um, the, the, at the moment, we're dealing with a politics of um, competition, conf conflicting interests. Um, but how might you, within Scotland, as leader of the Labour Party, and within the UK more generally, um, pursue a politics of consensus? where we're actually building some more, more cross-party dialogue, more cross-party agreement that includes um, the population at large and, and doesn't simply end up pursuing the will of half who chose to leave. Okay, well, I mean, I think um, um, one of the reasons why the, um, the SNP has, has rode back from the position which it took last year is because of the reaction on the doorsteps, John. I, I mean, the, uh, I, was, I was quite taken aback by the extent to which um, uh, in the lead up to the local elections last year and then on into the general election, that people on the doorsteps were angry that their vote was being disregarded. They were either angry because their vote was being disregarded because they'd voted in 2014 to stay inside the UK and uh, a second independence referendum was being floated. But there were considerable numbers of people I came across who were angry because they voted yes in 2014 and voted to leave in 2016 and felt as though that they were being coerced against the way they had voted into the European Union. So I think that this is a, this is a live question in Scottish politics for, uh, for those of all <laughs> persuasions on the constitutional uh, on the constitutional question, I mean, I, um, you know, as I said earlier on, I uh, I campaigned for a Remain vote, and I uh, and uh, and to uh, and uh, to respond to the notional question, if there was a referendum tomorrow, I would vote to remain and campaign for a Remain vote again. Uh, but the decision, in my view, has been taken, and I and I I just think it's a dangerous place to get into for uh, elected politicians to say, well, we set the terms of the referendum. You know, we set the terms of the referendum. If, if we don't like the result, 
I'm afraid we need to live with the consequences of the result and try and make it work as best as best that we can. So I'm not sure. I'm not sure, John, that there will be overwhelming pressure on the Scottish Labour Party uh, if and when it's elected into government in 2021 in Scotland to seek a Scottish only path into the European Union. I just I just can't see uh, see that. I mean, I have to say there was a, a time during my uh, uh, when I worked at the STUC, um, uh, Campbell Christie was on the uh, Economic and Social Committee, and there was, there was lots of talk in the 90s about a Europe of the regions. Uh, but that doesn't really seem to have materialised. It seems to have, uh, maybe it's because of the growth and enlargement and the, the, the introduction of accession states that's changed the dynamic of some of that. Uh, but there doesn't seem to be a, a huge... Um, uh, dynamic on uh, on that kind of Europe of the regions model, but w one incidentally which I find quite an attractive model. Um, on the um, on the whole question of of whether we can forge uh, a consensus, I mean, I, I suppose my uh, my language probably is quite uh, polarizing. I have to say because I do because on the one hand I do see um, a very um, a very anti. Uh, message, an anti-European Union message coming from the leadership of the Conservative Party at a UK level, certainly. Uh, and on the other hand, you know, in the, in, I think, paragraph seven of the um, Scottish Government's uh, paper uh, produced two weeks ago said that the best outcome environmentally, socially and economically is for Scotland to be an independent state inside the European Union. So that in the end, that's, that's where their positions are and they're quite different from the position, I think, and the space that I think the Labour Party occupies. And the Labour Party is trying to be pragmatic, is trying to talk about outcomes and not just the processes, is trying to concentrate on um, how we can best uh, safeguard both employment, industry, uh, public services, uh, but also the rights that we uh, have, have, have secured through our membership of the European Union. And, um, and, and I have to say that I am... Um, uh, uh, at the risk of offending people, I, I mean, I, I, I've, I find it quite hard to trust the Conservatives on the question of devolution. Even now, I find it quite hard to trust them. And I am uh, I'm not persuaded that this is all just um, happenstance and we couldn't get around to it or we couldn't get a formulation of words that quite suited the amendment that we were looking for. I'm extremely uh, sceptical and concerned about where we are with the withdrawal bill and whether or not we're going to get... Uh, a proper uh, recognition of almost 20 years of devolution. Uh, so, so I'm, I'm uh, you know, I think we're right to be uh, on the heels of both the SNP uh, and the uh, the Conservative uh, Party in in power in both places, uh, and I think we're right to be trying to forge through this a more distinctive, pragmatic uh, Labour agenda. Because there has been lots of talk in the debate about power grabs. And I think it's a, it's a highly emotive language, isn't it? Um, uh, and I think it's it's not unreasonable, maybe, to say that what's happened so far looks like a, a power grab. But there's another power grab that I am concerned about, and that's the power grab by um, uh, bigger corporates over the rights that have been secured through things like the social chapter and some of the health and safety provisions that's been that have been agreed. Because there, there will be, I think, intense pressure at a UK level to see a dilution of some of these terms. And I think it was telling that when uh, examined in Parliament before, uh, just before Christmas uh, on whether she would um, uh, continue to uh, enact the provisions of the Working Time uh, Directive and the regulations that flowed from it when transposed into UK law, Theresa May refused to give that undertaking. So, uh, you, know, I, 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 you know, I think the, um, uh, I think that the, uh, the battle is on, and I'm sorry to use that language, but I think the battle is on to, to make sure that we do uh, safeguard uh, those rights which have been um, uh, provided through the uh, legislation of the European Union that haven't been, uh, that, that, that I think could be potentially under, under threat. I think there's a wider point, Alan, which, which I didn't really mention. And this is where I'll get long stares from people who are here to keep an eye on me. But, the, um, but, but one of the things that strikes me is that... Um, in these areas like agriculture and fisheries and environmental protection and state aids and public procurement, we're moving from a situation, and I know it's, a, it's from a multinational situation to a, a devolved situation, but we're moving from a situation where you've got 
a European Commission, um, uh, subjecting its proposal to the scrutiny of the European Parliament, which has got some powers of initiative now, uh, uh, which in the end uh, has to have the sign-off of the European uh, Council of Ministers, uh, which uh, is then subject to the scrutiny of the European Court of Justice. And in its stead, we're putting everything in, in the parla a unitary parliament. So, I, I mean, I think it does raise important questions for us to consider about whether our democratic apparatus is right, whether we've got enough checks and balances there. And I know that, um, I think, um, Ruth Davidson spoke, and maybe we're finding an area of consensus, but I think Ruth Davidson spoke about um, uh, a petition in which she's received and considerations that I've given to whether there could be a, some kind of environmental court established to safeguard some of those areas where uh, standards have been set and, and, and that would safeguard some of the protections that communities currently enjoy. So I, I think there is a legitimate debate to be had about whether we are, uh, uh, we've got the capacity. I mean, there's been lots of discussion in the, in the Scottish Parliament about um, um, whether or not there is the capacity in the Parliament to deal with a lot of the uh, uh, legislative changes that will come through as a result of the uh, uh, cascading of changes as a result of Brexit and, and what that will do to parliamentary time and should the standing orders of the Parliament be adjusted to take account of that. But there's also a bigger question, it seems to me, about what happens beyond that. You know, you know what happens beyond Brexit? Where is the is the capacity in the Parliament there, uh, and do we need therefore to have a look at um, um, how the Parliament is um, uh, is made up and what support and capacity it's got? So I, you know, I think I think there are some consequential um, questions here, which which are legitimate for us as uh, people living uh, in a democracy for us to consider. Are there two more consequential questions? Ah, we have one at the back, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll show bias towards a person that happens to work for the Institute of Faculty of Actuaries on the left-hand side. <laughs> there was one at the back as well. Hi, thank you, Alan. Thank you, Richard. Um, ben Kemp from the Institute of Faculty of Actuaries. Um, thank you very much for the uh, le lecture. Um, R Richard, you, you say that you support the will of the people and, and, and you recognize the will of the people, notwithstanding, in a sense, your own judgment to the contrary, in the, in the sense that you, you voted the other way. And that's a very uh, honorable position to take. But surely there must be limits to that. And I guess I'm interested in you know, how bad would this deal have to look? And, I mean, people make mistakes, right? <coughs> Electorates make mistakes and we're all human and people can at some point be entitled to another go at something they got wrong, if indeed they get it wrong. How bad would the deal have to look for you actually not to support it? And there was one at the back. Um, Mungo Bove from the Faculty of Advocates. Uh, you said recently that you didn't think that the Brexit deal would get uh, through um, parliamentary scrutiny in Westminster and you predicted a general election as a consequence. Um, two things from that. I wonder whether, in fact, an, another referendum isn't more likely. But you, assuming that you're right, that the consequence is another um, general election, I wonder how you see that general election playing out in terms of its Brexit outcome. Yeah, well, well, I mean, certainly um, on um, on Ben's question, that's a very interesting question about the limits on uh, the principle of democracy. And uh, I mean, I mean, I think that the the way things are going at the moment, um, it's certainly um, well within the realms of possibility that Labour will vote against the deal that comes back. So, in in terms of the of the and, and of course it wasn't originally there was going to be no recourse to Parliament with the deal at all, uh, let alone recourse to the people. So um, uh, so uh, at least we've secured uh, that there will be a meaningful parliamentary vote on the deal, and uh, and I've you know I've uh, um, predicted that as things stand and the way things are looking that there is a strong likelihood that the deal which comes back and. Uh, 
you know, there have been further developments just in the last 24 hours about whether we'd be a member of the customs union or what the relationship with any customs, not just a member of the, the customs union, but the relationship that would exist between the customs union and the UK seems to be all bets off as well. Uh, so, so we're starting to get into areas where it becomes more and more difficult to see, to see how that would sustain uh, the kind of um, jobs first, economy first approach that Labour is taking. So I can certainly see there being growing evidence that we will almost certainly vote down uh, the deal when it comes back to the UK Parliament. Um, and, uh, uh, and which leads on to Mungo's question in a sense, because I, I can see that uh, uh, precipitating a, a major uh, constitutional crisis. I don't I mean the DUP's position on this, I think, will be interesting. Um, uh, but I can see there being uh, growing pressure, uh, even amongst um, uh, the ranks of the Conservative MPs, uh, there will be growing pressure to uh, find an alternate way of resolving this. And I think one of the ways they may seek to resolve it is by uh, being forced to, uh, or, or volunteering actually in the end, to call a general election. So I, so I think that the, 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 the likelihood of a general election, and I have to say to you, if I'm being honest with you, when I've been asked that question before, Mungo, it's been in the context of, well, your Brexit spokesperson, Neil Findlay, says there'll be a second, independent, uh, a second uh, European referendum. Brexit referendum, and I'm not sure that they will. I think uh, I think our view is that all options are open, and that and that we don't we don't absolutely rule out uh, any of these provisions. Uh, I think it's extremely unlikely that there would be a second referendum on Brexit, uh, but I do think it's much more likely that there will be uh, the precipitation of an election around which um, the party's positions on Brexit will be discerned. And who knows, maybe by then there'll be an internal referendum in the Labour Party and our position may have changed as well, I don't know. But I, but I, I, I think that there is a, um, I, I think that there will be, um, uh, there is the great potential. I mean, if you're as old as me, you can remember things like 1974. I mean, I think that we're, we're, in, the, we're in the realms of uh, this being about how the country is governed and who rules and, uh, and, and there are various competing um, uh, balances of forces taking place there. And there has been long-standing uh, discomfort inside the Conservative Party, not exclusively, but particularly inside the Conservative Party between uh, different competing interests. Uh, and, and so I can, I can see there being... Um, uh, a point at which it will become necessary for an election to be called. There's the man that looks like Jeremy Peake Jeremy who's put Pete. his hand up at the top and there's another one over there on the right hand side. Um, thank you very much uh, Jeremy Pete. Uh, you, I very much welcome your emphasis on productivity and agree with you that improving productivity is critical for a post-Brexit Scotland which is after all, what we're supposed to be focusing on in this series. Uh, I wonder whether you agree with what Ruth Davidson said last week uh, on the, basically on the skills side, whereas I took her to be arguing for a reallocation of resources within the education budget in Scotland to an extent away from HE and towards FE apprentices and flexible skills training for our population as we go into to the unknown uh, and that, that that would help productivity. And if I can have a quick second bite at that, I missed specific suggestions from you as to what you would do in power in Holyrood to actually implement, give me one or two policies that you believe would assist to improve productivity within Scotland. Uh, I'm Gavin McCrone. Um, the Scottish Government's study of the effects of Brexit showed that almost all the options were going to be damaging. And while that might be dismissed as influenced by their party position, the fact is that the Department for Exiting the EU in London came up with the same answer, it seems, which was then leaked. Uh, so it's fairly conclusive that uh, damage is most likely. It's least likely if we were to remain in the single market. And from this point of view, I find the, the position of the Labour Party puzzling because it's not really very clear where the Labour Party stands at all. I mean, you have said at some length quite a lot about the single market, and I welcome that. But the easiest thing is just to stay in it, for God's sake. So why don't we? Yeah. There's some posers. Okay, yeah. <laughs> 
Well, being only I one or two. I, ideas I, just, I never thought I'd be interrogated by Jeremy Pete and Gavin McCrone at the same time. <laughs> I feel honoured. I've, I've read all of your books. I mean, the uh, yeah. Well, on the uh, on 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 Gavin McCrone's question, I mean the. Um, I suppose the answer is that we are in favour of um, uh, maximum access to the single market. We uh, uh, take a view that uh, um, membership of the single market implies membership of the EU and the referendum result was to exit the EU. So um, the, the, um, the idea that um, we could uh, conceivably be Associate members, um, a la Norway, I suppose, is something which uh, we haven't completely ruled out. But I think the, uh, the, 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 the position we've taken is that we think uh, the overriding object should be to uh, have tariff-free access uh, to, that, uh, to that single market. We think that there are potential disadvantages in being in a Norway-style Norway agreement, uh, uh, arrangement where um, you are a rule taker, but you're not a rule maker. So that's um, uh, that's part of the answer uh, uh, to that. But I mean, I agree. You know, I agree with you um, on many things, and I agree with you that there is. And as I said, uh, you know, quite early on, that I campaigned to remain because I thought to leave would provide a, a significant economic shock to the economy, and uh, and and I, I stand by that. And I, I don't think anything that's been published or leaked or emerged uh, does anything to. Um, uh, to, to do anything other than to reinforce that view. But I think that the referendum result stands and we need therefore to do what we can do to get the best deal uh, from the exit process. And that's really where, that's really where the Labour Party has been in this, um, in, in this period of time after the, um, after the referendum result came out. I have to say as well, um, uh, just for the record, I mean, the um, opinion poll evidence that was uh, put together after the EU referendum showed that um, amongst Labour voters there was a very high Remain vote. I mean, I think the the evidence I saw was that I think the amongst Liberal Democrat voters it was a, a, a Remain vote of around 68 percent, and amongst Labour voters it was a Remain vote of around 64 percent. The problem was uh, amongst the Conservatives the Remain vote was 39 percent. And that was that was where the uh, that was where the referendum was won and lost. So I think we are arguing for access to uh, uh, maximum access to the single market without there being uh, necessarily membership of the uh, of the single market. And the argument also goes that the uh, existing arrangement just simply uh, cannot be perpetuated. That the that we're coming out of the EU, therefore it's about a renegotiation. It's about striking a different arrangement and a new deal rather than a continuation of uh, of membership. On uh, uh, Jeremy Pete's question about uh, raising productivity and investment in education, I, I do think that we need to get um, greater parity of esteem between vocational education and higher education. And I think um, I hear that not just amongst um, uh, people in the engineering industry, I hear that amongst people in higher education. Uh, you know, I think there's a growing understanding uh, and, a, and a view out there that, uh, that we need to um, uh, start to look a bit more like um, a society and an economy that offers people uh, uh, more even chances. And um, uh, as far as um, boosting productivity is concerned, um, I think in, in, in no small measure, I think that frankly comes back to investment and the investment institutions which exist or don't exist. There has been uh, um, in the pipeline for over 10 years, I think, a Scottish uh, government proposal to set up a Scottish investment bank and um, it's been relaunched again recently and uh, the, the, somebody's working on the guy from Tesco Bank, his name escapes me, Bernie Higgins. Bernie Higgins is working on it. So, so we may see something emerge uh, in, that, uh, in, in that vein, but I think that uh, th we, we've got, um, uh, we've got um, agencies of the state like the Scottish Manufacturing Advisory Service which is there ostensibly to try to improve the way that uh, manufacturing industry works. Uh, and I think uh, the idea of having uh, regular health checks uh, through that, but with the resource base with it, whether through an investment bank or otherwise, is, is, uh, is one of the routes, uh, one of the routes uh, forward. It's, I mean, it's interesting that part of the 
um, scenario painted in the uh, Scottish government's uh, recent analysis is that um, they place a lot of store on foreign direct investment driving up productivity. And I know there's been, over the years, there's been some work on inward investment and the relationship between uh, inward investment and, le and relative levels of productivity, uh, which may have something to do with the fact it's you may be comparing newer investment versus uh, older, um, uh, older uh, uh, productive facilities. I, I, I don't know. But, uh, but, uh, but I think that there needs to be, um, uh, I, I, I think that it's fair to recognise that there will be a change in investment flows in and out of Scotland as a result of Brexit. And, and I think one of the, one of the, one of the things uh, which has occupied me for uh, a number of years is the extent to which the Scottish economy is overseas owned. If you, I mean, we did, we'd got um, the Parliament's uh, information and uh, research people to provide a breakdown uh, last year when we produced the industrial strategy. And uh, compared to every other nation and region of the UK, uh, the proportion of um, uh, economic turnover in Scotland uh, in overseas ownership was, uh, was significantly higher than, than most anywhere else. Uh, London's about 22%, Scotland's 33%. I mean, there's, so there's, there's a large dependency on overseas investment. And, and there, there's been, an, and I'm looking at people in the room that have been party to these debates, there's been a long-standing debate about uh, why we've got a balance of ownership like that and, and whether things can be done to try to stimulate uh, indigenous ownership uh, more, uh, whether there is anything that can be done to uh, uh, safeguard uh, some takeover and merger activity, some of which is... Uh, 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 Beneficent, some of which is hostile, uh, because increasingly uh, and repeatedly we see um, uh, businesses uh, growing to a certain size uh, being uh, being taken over and acquired. And I, so I, I think that there that there may be something in there too about uh, what kind of industrial policy we need and what kind of planning we need. And so on the also related, Jeremy, to the productivity uh, uh, front. I, I, one of the things which I think is um, is sorely needed is more planning in the economy and I know that for some people that might be an anathema but I, I, I just can't for the life of me understand why we pour uh, so much public money into the economy uh, and don't necessarily have the skill sets or the productive base uh, to meet that demand which we are stimulating in the economy and so we lose a lot of the benefits that go with the supply chain that would build uh, those renewable energy farms, or that would uh, would uh, would um, uh, make for those big public infrastructure projects. There's a lot of leakage out of the economy. Now, I'm not for a minute uh, suggesting that we close all that leakage, uh, but I think we could be an awful lot better in planning ahead to make sure that we get the skill sets that we need to make sure we've got the uh, uh, supporting business infrastructure that we need, so that there is a public uh, and uh, local economic benefit from some of this uh, large public investment which goes into the economy and I think uh, you know I, I think uh, when I look across um, other parts of Europe that seems eminently possible I think that's the kind of thing we can do here I think it's the kind of thing we should be doing anyway irrespective of Brexit I just happen to think that if Brexit's going to happen and in my view it almost certainly is uh, it places a new emphasis and a new urgency on us doing those kind of things to change the way our economy is owned and run. Now, I think we might get one more question in, if it's short. So that's a challenge to, there's a, there's a lady in front of Jeremy Pete. Thank you, I'll try and make it short. Laura Dunlop, um, I'm a trustee of the Institute. There's been a bit of chat about Labour possibly voting against the final deal. I'm struggling with the logic of that we understand it would be a vote against the deal, but what would it be a vote for? Would it be a vote for staying in, or would it be a vote for leaving with no deal? Can you do a short answer to that as well? <laughs> yeah. A no vote would be um, in order to provide a platform for re a renegotiation. I mean, I, just, I, I, I don't think no deal is, is where we want to be. Uh, but I think that there will. I, I, I think if the divi if the deal that's brought back is sufficiently disadvantageous economically in terms of people's rights, then it's the duty of anybody in Parliament 
uh, who stands on a platform of Labour to vote against it, it seems to me. So uh, um, I can see that being a part of a process, as I, as I tried to describe earlier on, which will uh, put real pressure on the position of the government at the time, depending on how that vote uh, works out. But I can see um, I can see there easily being a situation where a poor deal uh, will not command the support of the House of Commons and will put the government in a very difficult position constitutionally. And, and, and that's why I think uh, we will be in a position where, rather than there being a second Brexit referendum, I think we'll be in a position where there will be a, a, a much greater likelihood of there being a general election. The, the, the last general election was called in order to give Theresa May a mandate so that she could go in there to negotiations with a much bigger majority. Um, I, I was rather sceptical about whether that theory actually applied and whether uh, Angela Merkel and uh, Monsieur Macron would be bothered whether Theresa May had a 30-seat majority or a 130-seat majority, actually. But uh, that, was the, that was the precept upon which she called the election. And, and, and on that test, she lost it. So I think since that point, she has been in a fairly precarious position. I think um, if the direction of travel around the Brexit deal is going in the direction I believe it is, we will reach a point where it will be impossible for her to get that through Parliament. And that, I think, in turn will create the conditions in which there will be a, a huge call for an election to be called. Thank you, Richard. Can I ask Sir John Elvidge to give a vote of thanks, please? Thank you, Alan. Be before I undertake the pleasant task of um, thanking, uh, thanking Richard, can I just take a minute for a sadder uh, subject? As many of you will know, uh, Sir Gerald Elliott uh, died last week. Uh, Gerald was the co-founder of the David Hume Institute with Alan Peacock, its first uh, executive director. He was the chair of the trustees from uh, 1985 to 1995 and continued to be a strong supporter uh, of the Institute uh, through his uh, family charitable trust, the, the Binks Trust, and a regular attender at, uh, uh, at these events and other uh, Institute uh, events until recently when ill health prevented him from, uh, from doing so. Uh, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that the David Hume Institute would not still exist uh, without the sustained support that Gerald uh, gave to it. Uh, and we, uh, I'm sure, all extend our condolences uh, to his family and honour his great contribution to Scottish life in this and other ways. If I can turn, turn back to, to, to Richard, uh, it always sounds like damning with faint praise uh, when I begin uh, by uh, thanking our speakers for being here. Uh, but nothing compels the leader of Scot <coughs> leaders of Scotland's political parties to come and share with us uh, their thinking uh, in, this, uh, in, in this series, and nothing compels them to engage with difficult and complex subjects uh, like uh, Scotland uh, after uh, Brexit. So I think we, uh, we do, uh, we, do act, uh, we, we owe uh, a debt of gratitude to them, but particularly to Richard, uh, who, as a, a new leader of the, uh, uh, the Scottish Labour Party, uh, is making a fresh choice to, uh, to, uh, to be part of this uh, series. So uh, it's, it's more than thanks for turning up. It's, uh, it's gratitude for breathing life into, uh, into this process of discussion and, uh, and debate. But I also want to uh, thank uh, Richard for the fullness with which he engaged in presenting uh, a vision uh, of Scotland, uh, the other side of the uh, of, of the Brexit uh, uh, Brexit process. Although although Jeremy was harsh about the level of uh, specificity in what uh, 
uh, in what Richard said. Uh, I, I thought that Richard engaged very fully uh, with, um, with painting a picture of the outcomes uh, that he wanted to see, uh, the kind of Scotland, the kind of economy uh, that he wanted to see. And that, that is precisely uh, what, uh, what we hoped our speakers would, uh, would lead us to be able to uh, contemplate uh, as a result of this uh, series. So we are very grateful uh, for, uh, for such a, a, a complete engagement with the, the challenges of that crystal ball gazing. So I invite you all to join me in thanking you. Okay, well, good evening, everybody. My name's uh, Nasser Mir. I, I appreciate I stand between you and the wine reception, not for the first time in this lecture series. I was meant to be joined by my colleague, Dr. Fiona McNeil, who's going to talk to you about robotics and artificial intelligence and all the work we do in schools, but unfortunately, she's unavoidably detained, so you get me once more. But this is just an opportunity to say a few words about the Young Academy of Scotland, who are a, a co-sponsor of this lecture series this year, as we have been, of other lecture series in previous years. And those of you who have been Coming to these lecture series before, we'll know something about our work, our aims, objectives, our strategic mission, and the kind of activities we've undertaken. So I won't repeat those here, other than to say that we are made up of medics, of historians, of civil servants, engineers, social scientists, physical scientists of all possible kinds, as well as members of the business community and industry here in Scotland. We are an international collective, and we also have people from West Yorkshire amongst our ranks, uh, the best kind of people in, in, my, in my sense as a fellow Yorkshire person. Um, there's always a multitude of activities underway, but there's just an opportunity, I think, to say a few words about uh, some of our first Lego League activities in which we have held helped uh, support local schools in, uh, across Scotland uh, participate in a robotics and artificial intelligence tournament. Um, one of our schools um, which participated, West Linton Primary, uh, the school team was West Linton Wasps, became the uh, UK and Ireland champions and then last year went to Chicago and competed in proceedings there where I think they met uh, Barack Obama. So it would have been over a year ago. Oh, gosh, time flies. Um, <laughs> Um, one of our recent activities, in addition to our work on robotics, has been on Brexit, and our uh, Brexit report is now available to download. Um, in it, we look at a number of scenarios that prospective um, um, uh, industries and sectors may may have to encounter as we move towards something like a, a Brexit uh, outcome. Um, we'd encourage you to have a look at that and consult that. Um, we've also set up what's called the Brexit Laboratory, which is the first real-time account in Scotland of people who are in Scottish sectors, Scottish um, industries. Um, uh, kind of a first-hand uh, opportunity for them to report their experiences of negotiating Brexit and the uncertainty that comes with that as, as people who work and live in Scotland. And that's now available to download too. Um, I, I think we mentioned at the beginning that we had a wine reception ready for you outside. And so without further ado, I think I'll direct you towards that. So if you could join me once more in thanking Richard for this evening's proceedings. <laughs> <laughs>